So the first, as is our custom, we'll look, turn to the Parsha in a nutshell, see if I can share the screen. And here we have the final portion of Genesis, the portion of Vayechi. Literally, Vayechi means, and he lived. And in some ways, it's a very happy and uplifting Parsha because you read about how the family has been reunited and everybody's living together in peace after so many years in Egypt. On the other hand, Jacob is going to pass away and Joseph is going to pass away. And the reader at this point may or may not know it, but we are in Egypt. So this slavery is just, is just a few uh, decades away. But at this point, when the reader reads the Parsha, it doesn't all look bad because we don't know what's going to unfold. So a lot of it is very positive. A lot of it is full of blessings, the blessings that Jacob blesses his children uh, before he passes away. So let's read it. Um, by Echina Nachel, Jacob lives the final 17 years of his life in Egypt. Before his passing, he asks Joseph to take a note that he will bury him in the Holy Land. So Jacob does not want to remain in Egypt. He wants to be brought back to Israel. He blesses Joseph's two sons, Menashe and Ephraim, elevating them to the status of his own sons as progenitors of tribes within the nation of Israel. So we're going to discuss this. Two of his grandchildren become like his children. Ephraim and Manasseh, Joseph's children, become like Jacob's children himself. The patriarch desires to reveal the end of days to his children, but he is prevented from doing so. So Jacob then instead blesses his children, assigning to each his role as a tribe. Judah will produce leaders, legislatures, and kings. Priests will come from Levi, scholars from Yisachar, seafarers from Zebulun, school teachers from Simon, soldiers from God, judges from Dan, olive growers from Asher, and so on. Reuven is rebuked for confusing his father's marriage bed, Simon and Levi for the massacre of Shechem and the plot against Joseph, Naphtali is granted the swiftness of a deer, Benjamin the ferociousness of a wolf, and Joseph is blessed with beauty and fertility. So these, this is a very poetic and beautiful part of the parsha. Hopefully we'll have time. We'll delve into that at least a little bit. And then you get to the passing of, jo of Jacob, a large funeral procession consisting of Jacob's descendants, Pharaoh's ministers, the leading citizens of Egypt, and the Egyptian Calver Calverly, Cal Calverly, can't get this word this morning, accompanies Jacob on his final journey to the Holy Land, where he is buried in the Machpelah cave in Hebron with the other patriarchs and most of the matriarchs, except for Rachel. Joseph too dies in Egypt at the age of 110. He too instructs that his bones be taken out of Egypt and buried in the Holy Land, but this will come to pass only when the Israelites ex only with the Israelites' exodus from Egypt. Of course, the reason for that is when Jacob passes away, Joseph is still the leader of Egypt. So Joseph can still speak to Pharaoh and get permission to move his father back to Israel. But once Joseph passes away, the Jewish people don't have that same um, freedom to be able to take Joseph out, out of Egypt and back to Israel. So they do so only when they themselves leave Egypt hundreds of years later. Before his passing, Joseph conveys to the children of Israel a statement from which they will draw their hope and faith in the difficult years of, uh, to come. God will surely remember you and bring you up out of this land to the land which he swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And this is pretty much, the, in the nutshell, the conclusion of the Parsha. And now we're going to get this up. We're going to hopefully discuss some of these themes in depth. And of course, there's a lot to discuss. So if anybody has any specific comments or specific avenues that they want to explore, please share. Otherwise, we can- I have a question. Journey. Yes. Uh, if they could possess 17 years, so the famine is over by this time, and they all go up to Egypt now, and Jacob has told them that they're going to have troubles. Why are they staying there if they can leave? They all go up in a procession. They know there's going to be a terrible time in Egypt. Why aren't they discussing moving back, which they just did by having this big procession? And they love Israel. They want to, they want to get buried there, and they know the future. According to this, they know the future. 
So that's sure. a very good question. That's an excellent question. I don't even know where to begin because there's different avenues how to answer this question. Let's just start with the first assumption. The first assumption is that the famine has concluded. Now, there, it's not so simple. It is not so simple at all because we know that Jacob, um, Joseph's dream was that there'll be seven years of plenty and then seven years of famine. Now, Jacob, Jacob um, Joseph's brothers, Joseph, Joseph is reunited with his family two years into the famine. That we know. That's what, that's what the verse says clearly. And Joseph tells his father and his brothers, come down to Egypt because there's another five years to the famine. That's what the verse says. What happens after that is not clear because it's the, chrono the chron chronology of the verses is not clear. So at least I'll give you one opinion, which is the easiest opinion to answer your question. I'm not saying it's the only opinion and that, that needs more exploration, but I'll give you the simple, I'll give you one interpretation, which will hopefully, which is, which is probably the easiest way to answer your question. Um, the verses indicate that there's this whole discussion last week where Joseph tells the people here, I'm gonna give you grain, you plant the grain and you'll give 20% to the Pharaoh. Um, after they, first they have to sell their land and then, and then for, for grain, and you get this whole back and forth. Bottom line takeaway is why, how are they planting grain if there's a famine, if there's no water? So many commentaries say, and Rashi quotes it, is that when Jacob comes, when Jacob comes down to Egypt, Egypt is blessed and the Nile overflows. And that's how, that's how, that's how all the fields were, were, were irrigated in Egypt because they had the canals from the Nile. So when the Nile overflows, it fills up all the canals and you can, and you can water the fields. Um, so it seems like when Jacob comes to Egypt, the famine is over, which explains why in this week he has such a, he has such a, um, a, a prominent funeral because the Egyptians respect Jacob tremendously. He finished the famine. The problem is that if Jacob finished a famine, uh, isn't Joseph's dream wrong? Wasn't this a prophecy that there'll be seven years of, fam of, of famine? So there are all kinds of interpretations. One interpretation is that the famine takes stops after two years when Jacob comes and starts again after Jacob passes away. And there's indication in the verses that this may have happened because after Jacob passes away, there's the whole story where the brothers come to Jacob and say, forgive us. And Jacob says, don't worry, I'm not gonna, I'm not, I'm not gonna punish you, of course not. And then he says, and I'm gonna sustain you and your children. I'm gonna give food, provide food for you and your children. Why does Joseph need to provide food for them and their children? And at that point, they've been living in Egypt for 17 years. They had, they, they were given the land of Goshen, which was fertile, and they were had, and they had their their sheep, and they raised cattle. Why do they need food from Joseph? So that's another indication that at that point, things start turning. The famine returns. They need Joseph's support. So that's an excellent question. This is just one interpretation. There are many many, many ways to think about this. You could think about the fact that they were comfortable in Egypt, hard to leave. You could think about the fact that the trouble they knew was coming was coming decades later. It wasn't immediate. And people have this tendency to delay um, trouble. They say, okay, we'll worry about it later because uh, not, the slavery didn't begin until all the brothers passed away many decades later. Another thing I would say, probably it's also they were in tune with the divine plan. In other words, there was a prophecy to Jacob. There was a prophecy to Abraham that his descendants are going to be. Um, foreigners in a foreign land for 400 years, and then they'll return to Israel. So they felt that this whole idea that, by, that, that, that they were uh, led to Egypt by Joseph, and Joseph is the leader of the land, is the divine plan. That's what they felt, and that was true. And the Megra says that one of the reasons why God orchestrates that Joseph should be sold is because Jacob will have, have to be brought to Egypt by one way or the other. And if it wouldn't be brought by, if it wouldn't, it, you know, even in chains, so to speak, that's what the Medrash says. But God in his kindness arranged for Jacob to come to, to Egypt in a dignified way. And a dignified way means with his son, the leader. And in that sense, in that sense, um, that was a certain kindness. So the point here is that they could, I don't know what did it, what made them stay, but it could, it could be that it could be that there was that there were multiple reasons uh, that were all tied in. So thank you for that. Can I throw out a question for later in the parsha? Please. Hey, Rabbi, I have a question. 
the flexibility of Judaism is really quite amazing. I mean, this is supposed to be 12 tribes. And so you have really 13, but you now have two half tribes. So I just would like you to comment on that the phenomenon. Well, let's talk about Menashe and Ephraim. We'll talk about that. Yes. Go ahead. Oh. Anytime. Yeah. We'll talk about that. Elisa wanted to mention something. Oh, actually, I realize it's from the last Parsha. Okay. Um, Say that to, we'll say that to 11. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay, so we'll start, we'll start thinking about the specific verses, the specific stories. A lot about this parsha, a lot of this parsha, the, to the Torah spends some time talking about uh, blessing the children. And there's a, not, and a quite, quite, amount, a, quite a, a chunk about Joseph's children specifically. And what happens is that Joseph hears that his father is getting old. He takes two of his sons and he brings them to, takes his sons, Menashe and Ephraim, brings them to his father, Jacob, <clears throat> to bless them. And here, there's this whole discussion where, first of all, he blesses Menashe and Ephraim in an extraordinary way, which is what Jill alluded to. And then he also has this whole discussion where he switches the order. He, blesses, he puts the older one in, instead of the younger one, which is a big problem because the Talmud asks the question, the Talmud says, how is it possible that something that Jacob himself made a mistake? What was the mistake? He honored Joseph more than the other brothers. What was the result of that mistake? It was a terrible mistake. What resulted of that mistake was the sale of Joseph, the animosity between the, in the family. And here, Jacob himself is continuing this pattern and once again, um, honoring the younger one over the, old, over the older one. And Jacob and Joseph is very offended. Joseph says, how can you do this? Don't do this. And Jacob says, I know what I'm doing. So we'll read some of these verses. We'll discuss Menashe and Ephraim. And hopefully we'll be able to, uh, usually we get stuck with an Ash and Ephraim, takes us 45 minutes to discuss. But this year we want to do a little bit of the poetry of the blessings as well. So we'll try to uh, get by the Menashe and Ephraim as quick as we can, even though there's no guarantees because we may get uh, pulled in to the drama. Okay, so what we want to do is if you want to find the verses and do a little reading inside and get a feel for what's happening here. Okay, so this is the this is the opening opening verses of the parsha. Jacob lives in, lives in Egypt for seventeen years. Um, his time draws near to die. He calls Joseph. He makes Joseph promise that he'll take him to Israel. Okay, fine. Now we go to chapter forty-eight. Let's read a few verses here. Chapter forty-eight. Now it came to pass after these incidents that someone said to Joseph, "Behold, your father is ill." So he took his two sons with him, Manasseh and Ephraim. And I read someone that somewhere I, a commentary who says. What does this verse tell you? Don't push off anything for later. You hear somebody is ill, run. Take the opportunity. Don't delay. That's what Joseph does. And so, um, so verse three, and Jacob says, okay, and someone, told Jake, and, and someone told Jacob and said, behold, your son Joseph is coming to you. And Israel summoned his strength and sat up in his bed, on the bed. Verse three, and Jacob said to Joseph, almighty God appeared to me in Luz in the land of Canaan and blessed me. And he sent to me, behold, I will make you fruitful and cause you to multiply. And I will make you into a congregation of peoples. And I will give this land to your seed after you for an everlasting inheritance. He says, wonderful. God came to me and I was coming back to Israel after being away for 20 years. I come back to Israel, Jacob says. The father says, God promised me he'll make me into a great people. Now, verse five drops the bomb. What's verse five? And now as for your, your two sons, who were born to you in the land of Egypt, until I come to you, to the land of Egypt, they are mine. Ephraim and Menashe shall be mine, like Reuven and Shimon. What is he saying? Two of my, two of your, of your children, two of my grandchildren become like my children. So now instead of having 12 tribes, there's 13 tribes, because Joseph is split in two, Menashe and Ephraim, or Ephraim and Menashe is his first. And then he says, but your children, if you beget any, any after them, shall be yours by their brother's names. They shall be called in their inheritance. In other words, this only applies to your two oldest sons, Menashe and Ephraim, but not any other son, children you'll have after that. So now we all of a sudden, he gives Joseph this extraordinary blessing. 
and he says, you're going to have, you, you, you become two tribes. Where does he do this? Why does he do it? Who, who, how, how does this happen? Why does he decide that two of his grandchildren are going to become two of his sons? So he alludes to that. Um, Jacob alludes to that in verse four. What does he say in verse four? God said to him when he came back to Israel, behold, I will make you fruitful and cause you to multiply. And I will make you into a congregation of peoples. So let's read some Rashi here. I'm going to open up the Rashi here. Let's see what Rashi says. And I will make you into a congregation of peoples. So I'm reading the Rashi here. He announced to me that another congregation of peoples was to be descended from me. Although he said to me, a nation and a congregation of nations shall come into existence from you, meaning three nations, by a nation, he promised me the birth of Benjamin. A congregation of nations means two in additional to Benjamin, but no other son was born to me. Thus I learned that one of my tribe, one of my tribes was destined to be divided into two. So now I am giving you that gift. So what do we see here? What Rashi is saying is as follows. Jacob's coming back to Israel. He has 11 sons. God tells him that you're going to have a nation and a congregation of nations will come from you. What does that mean? A nation and a congregation of nations is a minimum of three. A nation is one. Congregation of nations is plural. Smallest number of plural is two. So you have three. How many more children did Jacob have after that point? Well, he only had one, extra, one additional child, Benjamin. So what does Jacob, how does Jacob understand that promise that he's going to have another two children? It means one of his children becomes, will become two. And that's a sign of blessing. That's a sign of prominence. That's a sign of being uh, the leader in some sense. And he says, who's going to get that blessing? Jacob is going to, um, Joseph is going to get that blessing. Two of his sons become like Manasseh and Ephraim. Two of his sons become, Manasseh and Ephraim come like Reuben and Shimon become his children. What's happening here? What exactly? What what exactly? What what exactly is happening here? What is it? Why do you why do you need why why do we, what's the big significance of moving from twelve to thirteen and why Joseph's two sons? So there are many different angles, but I just want to say one point: um, the number thirteen is significant in Judaism. I know in the West, we don't like 13. You go to Manhattan, you can't find the 13th floor in any elevator. But in Judaism, 13 is very significant. Of course, the Bar Mitzvah is at 13. But there are other matters that are 13. First of all, 13 has the numerical value of Echad, 1. Echad is Aleph, Chet, Dalet, 1, 8, 4. It gets you to 13. Uh, the word Ahava, the word love, is 1, 5, 2, 5, 13 again. And that's something unique about 13. So some commentaries point out that if you look at the previous generations of the Jewish people, you have Abraham, you have Isaac, and then Jacob. In each generation, there was one person that was destined to, to, bring, to carry the legacy of Judaism. And even though there were multiple children, it was always passed on to one person. For the first time in Jewish history, in the short, period, in the short Jewish history, there's going to be multiple children that were given the, the legacy of Judaism to continue. In other words, there's not one cho cho chosen child. There are 12 chosen children. And that, of course, brings a uh, danger of the Jewish people dividing because you have 12 different people. So by inserting the number 13, the number 13 is the message that we have to be united as one because 13 creates that oneness because 13 has the numerical value of one. How do we become one? Through the ahava, through the love, which is also the numerical value of one. Okay, fine. That's a little bit about, about that. Now we're going to go to the more significant part. So first of all, Jacob is making a mistake. Jacob is, uh, in some sense, Jacob, I don't make a mistake. Jacob is honoring Joseph again, giving him a gift that other tribes don't have. I'm not sure that was such a wonderful idea in that family. But let's continue. It gets worse. What happens later? So we're going to turn the page. Second reading. Joseph takes his two sons, puts the older son on his father's right, right side, and the younger son on his father's left side. The right side represented strength. 
I guess he was a righty. So the right side represents strength. He wants the right hand to go on the head of the older son. What does Joseph, what does Jacob do? Verse 14. Of course, in this parsha, we're jumping back between his two names, Jacob and Israel. And there are all the different interpretations of when is Jacob employed and when is Israel employed. It's the same person. Why the different names? Um, some people say Israel is, the, of course, the more spiritual name, but it's also the name of joy. So once the family is reunited, and when Joseph is in a when when Jacob is in a holy state, in a spiritual state, and most importantly a joyous state, that's when the word Israel is used. So look at fourteen. But Israel stretched out his hand and placed it on Ephraim's head. I'm sorry, Israel stretched out his right hand and placed it on Ephraim's head, although he was the younger. And his left hand, he placed on Manasseh's head. He guided his hands deliberately, for Manasseh was firstborn. Shekel is an interesting word. Shekel could be crossed, but Shekel comes from the word wisdom. He did with wisdom, he switched the hands. Now, what do you think he did? What do you think happens when he switches his hands, when he puts his right hand on the younger brother, showing that the younger brother is going to be um, in some ways greater? What does that do to the father? What does that do to Joseph? So we turn the page, and of course, Joseph thinks this is a terrible idea. And Joseph saw that his father was placing his right hand on Ephraim's head, and it displeased him. So he held up his father's hand to remove it from upon Ephraim's head and to place it on Manasseh's head. So he now wants to take his, the right hand of his father and remove it again from the older son to from the younger son to the older son. And Joseph, the first time in the Torah where you have one of the children um, deliberately saying no to their father. I don't think that exists in the book of Genesis. Not everybody is honest. Some people kill their brother. Some people steal the blessings. They trick their father. But to tell your father no, this is unusual in the Torah. Look at verse 18. And Joseph says to his father, Lo avi. Not so, not so, father. Lo is no, no, father. Not, don't do this. This is a terrible idea. For this one is the first one. Put your right hand on his head. Verse 19. But his father refused. And he said, I know my son, I know. What does, I, what does I know my son I know? Does it mean I know he's the older one? You don't have to say, I know my son I know. He's saying it twice. Some commentaries say what he's saying is, I know what happened to you. I know that you you got sold into slavery and your brothers hated you because you were um, chosen. You were, uh, uh, because I, the father, um, favored you even though you were not the oldest. I know what happened. Nevertheless, I'm still doing what, what I'm doing. Why? He too will become a people. In other words, even the younger one will become great. I'm sorry, the older one will also become great. In other words, they both will be great. He too will become a people and he too will be great, but his younger brother will be greater than he. And his children's fame will fill the nations. The fame of the children of the younger one will fill the nations. See what that means. And verse 20 is a very beautiful verse, famous. So he blessed them on that day, saying, With you, Israel will bless, saying, May God make you like Ephraim and Menashe. And he placed Ephraim, the younger one, before Menashe. And this is a fascinating verse. Uh, when we want to bless our, our daughters, we say, May God make you like Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, and Leah. We mentioned the matriarchs. When we want to bless our, our, our sons, we don't say, May God make you like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We say, May God place you like Ephraim and Menashe. Why so? Because that's what Jacob said. That's verse 20. With you, Israel will bless, saying, may God make you like Ephraim and Manasseh. When Israel, when people, when Jews would want to bless their children, they'll say, may God make you like Manasseh and Ephraim, like Ephraim and Manasseh. And here he emphasized again the younger one first. And then, okay, so now this opens up a lot, of this, a, a, a lot to discuss. I don't want to spend too much time on it, maybe five or 10 minutes. And then we want to go to the blessings of, then we want to go to the blessings of, Jacob to his children. The elephant in the room, of course, is why are they special? Why does he keep doing this? Why doesn't Jacob learn from his mistakes? Why doesn't he stop uh, showing favoritism to the younger son? I mean, he should have learned a little bit from his experience. <laughs> okay, so if anybody in the meantime will take a 10 second, we'll take a 30 second break. If any, in the meantime, anyone has any questions or any suggestions or any jokes or anything else they want to share, please share. Otherwise, we go straight, we go, we continue to the answers, answers, the many different perspectives. We'll say one or two, and then we move on. Rabbi, could you um, explain again, what is the etymology of the word Ephraim and Menashe? Okay, so the Ephraim and Menashe, we'll get to that later. That well, Maybe I'll discuss it later, but Ephraim comes from the word pre. 
Hifrani, God made me fruitful. And what basically when Joseph comes into Egypt, when Joseph is sold into Egypt and eventually he, he, he went, once he becomes the leader of Egypt, he marries an Egyptian woman, the Do Asnat, and then he has two children. He names the first one Menashe. Menashe is a fun, a tricky name. Menashe literally means God made me, made me, Menashe literally means forget. So he names his child forget. Now, that's a strange name for a child, I agree. But he names his child forget. Why does he name his child the word forget, forget? So Rashi, so the verse itself explains. God made me forget my difficulties and the house of my father. In other words, the troubles, the troubles of my house and my father. That's one interpretation. I'm giving you now a simple interpretation, a straightforward interpretation before we get to the Hasidic interpretation. So the first interpretation is he's thanking God. God, I, was, I had all this trouble. I've been sold as a slave. I've been put in prison. But now, because I became so successful, God allowed me to forget my past. By the way, if you want to forget your past, don't name your kid, forget my past. <laughs> right? Obviously, that's uh, basically saying, I wish I could forget my past or I want to forget my past. This guy's not forgetting his past. He's deeply affected by his past to the extent that he names his son, forget my past. Okay. Just a to that, Rabbi. That's a, one second, Neil. That's a, that's a, that's Menashe. Ephraya means the next son, God made me fruitful in the land of my sorrow. God made me successful in Egypt. So is Jacob aware that Joseph named his son Menashe because he wanted to forget about his, the house of Jacob? So, so we, we have to analyze that question and that name, and we'll get to that in a little bit, hopefully. Rabbi, okay. did, um, did joke, Jacob uh, base his decision on the names and what they meant? That's, that's one thing. And that's did the prophecy that. work out also? Did one become greater than the other Rashi, in history? Yashi says, yes. If you look at the history, you look at Mena Ephraim becomes the leader of the 10, of the ten tribes. Ephraim becomes very dominant in the 10 tribes. If you want to know that phrase that says that his fame will pass throughout the nations, Rashi says that refers to the first leader of the Jewish people who brought them into Israel. And that was Joshua. Ah. And Joshua was the descendant of Ephraim. He was the leader of the tribe of, who was from the descendant of Ephraim. Now, just like now, um, Israel was always in the news, not just in, today, not just in 2020, but also always. Israel is a small strip of land, but there were 31 kings in Israel. How would the 31 kings in a, a town, in a, in, a, in a little Israel the size of New Jersey? The answer is it was a prominent place and every kingdom wanted a share of the land. So any movement that happens in Israel, it's gonna, the news travels. There's gonna be at least 31 kingdoms that hear about the news. So when Joshua, the leader of the Jewish people, enters the land of Israel with his army, with his conquest, in some ways, he's more famous than Moses, at least at the time. So that's Menashe, that's, that's Joshua, the son of Ephraim. Later on in Jewish history, you see that Ephraim becomes very populous and Ephraim becomes the leader of the 10 tribes. When the 10 tribes secede from, when the 10 tribes secede from, the, from, from Judah, from King David, from descendants of King David, they become, Ephraim becomes the leaders and Ephraim becomes the leaders and in some sense they're the most, they're the most prominent and therefore in the Bible, whenever the prophets refer to the 10 tribes, they usually refer to them as Ephraim. Not even, not Joseph, but Ephraim, referring to the 10 tribes because Ephraim was the most dominant. So that's the answer to that question. Okay, Without, there's so much to talk about. I just wanna take big picture, right? We're the final, we are the final verse. We're the final story of the book of Genesis. We discussed this on Sunday. We discussed Cain and Hevel. In some sense, you could read the book and you could say, that the entire purpose of the book of Genesis, in other words, what is the theme, the reoccurring theme? Well, we're looking for reoccurring themes. The theme of the, re the reoccurring theme in the book of Genesis is that the second child is chosen over the first. In other words, in other words, undermining the position of the Bechor of the firstborn. That starts all the way from the first story, Cain and Hevel, the first story of the siblings, where Cain, the older one, God does not accept his blessing, uh, his, 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 his um, offering, and God chooses the offering of his second brother. It goes to Abraham's children where the younger one, Isaac, was chosen. It goes to um, Isaac's children where Jacob is chosen. Jacob steals the blessings, and 
In Jacob's family, the same thing. Joseph is favored. And then in Joseph's family, Ephraim is favored over Menashe. So there's a consistent thread. And the Torah, we're supposed to be talking about this. Why? Because the Torah spends so many words at the end of the story, at the end of the, of the, of the, of the, of the book, in this week's Parsha, figuring out. He crossed his hands. He didn't cross his hands. It's not so significant. There was nobody there. There was no paparazzi. There was no press. So we crossed his hands. Nobody even noticed. By the way, maybe Menashe and Ephraim didn't notice it, the crossing of the hands. If you're sitting under your under your, uh, if you're sitting on the floor and the grandfather crosses his hands, I don't know if the kid that, 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 that the kids saw it. Why make a big deal? Why make a big deal? No, it's a big deal. It's a big deal, and it's part of the story. Now the question is, what is the message? Here you have well many opinions. Everybody's gonna, everyone's gonna 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 connect to their, basically, your own, whatever you feel the, per, the, the theme of the book is, that's that you're going to sort of try to interpret, interpret the story in light of that theme. So there are various interpretations of what the theme, of, of what, the, what the message of, that, of, the, of this pattern is. But I think the fact that there is a pattern is undeniable. It's a pattern that we're undermining the position of the Bechor, the position of the firstborn, and we are highlighting the position of the second one. Um, Rabbi, is that also why Moses supersedes Aaron? Um, in some sense, it continues in the next book. In some sense, yeah, in some sense, it continues in the next book. So, so um, that, that, that Aaron is older than Moses and Moses is younger, correct? Yeah. I always like a, a, something you, you taught a few years back of that it, it, each set of the sons uh, is less violence, gets along more, and it's uh, it's showing the progression and that we need to learn how to get along before we can move into um, into the next Correct. book. So that's another point. Another point is if you look at the pattern, you wanna say, are we advancing? Yeah, the characters in the book of Genesis are advancing. How they react to the, to the, to the selection of the younger child changes. In the beginning, when the younger son is favored, so, a, so Cain kills his brother. Going down to, Asaph wants to kill his brother. The, jo, the brothers try to kill their brother, Joseph. Um, finally, Menashe and Ephraim, the first example of the two brothers not killing themselves, not killing each other, even though the younger one was chosen. So you're right. If you want to look at how we're advancing, if you look at how people react to the, cho to the to choosing of the second, of the younger brother, you will see progress. And Neil read ahead, so Neil knows that in the next book there's even an advancement because he, the, the God tells Moshe, and Moshe doesn't want to take the job of leading the Jews for various reasons. One of the reasons is go to my older brother, leave me alone. My, I don't want to, I don't want, I don't want to make my bro older brother jealous. And God then tells, he doesn't say it explicitly, but we understand this from the answer. God says, Don't worry, Aaron will help you. He will see you. He will be happy in his heart. Not only won't be, he'll be jealous, but he'll be happy. So that is the advancement. So you're right. You can see how the, the families are advancing. People are advancing in how they respond to the selection of the younger brother. Okay, wonderful. But you see, that just emphasizes the pattern that the younger one is being selected across the board always continuously. Why? What's the message? What's the meaning? So one interpretation is as follows. One interpretation is that what does it mean to be the firstborn? Did I earn the right to be the firstborn? No. The firstborn is just something that it comes by birth. I don't have to earn it. I don't have to work for it. And in the ancient world, the firstborn, you get certain privileges. What are the privileges? You get a double portion of the, of the, of the, of the, of the estate, of your parents' estate, and you're considered the leader. Okay, so that's an advantage, and that's wonderful. The Torah is about telling us, undermining this model, but not fully, only partially, and I'm gonna to try to explain how that works. What the Torah is here to tell you is that is true in worldly matters. We have no problem in a system where the older brother gets more, gets a double portion in the estate of the parents because his job is to be the leader of the brothers, the leader of the family, and to take care of the family. We have no problem with the older brother being the leader in material, physical matters. That's not our problem. Our problem becomes that in the ancient world, 
the older brother was the leader in all areas. In other words, it was understood that he's the spiritual leader as well. And what is the Torah telling us throughout the entire book of Genesis? Throughout the entire book of Genesis, one interpretation, in other words, one way to look at it is the Torah is telling you that the person who's going to be chosen is the person for the spiritual leadership. Spiritual leadership does not come by birth. Spiritual leadership comes from the person earning that place through his own work. And that's much more tied into humility. And humility is almost never the position of the older son in the ancient world. So what's the theme here? What's the message? The message is that when it comes to a spiritual relationship with God, it doesn't come by birth. It comes by effort. And that's what you see throughout all the sons. The older one is more arrogant. The older one is more powerful. The older one is naturally stronger. Look at Yishmael compared to, to Isaac. Look at Asaf compared to Jacob. The pattern continues. The older brothers are stronger, more powerful. And yet the younger one is supposed to be more, is, 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 is selected because we want to make the point that the spiritual connection to God is one of is one that a person has to earn it that cannot come by birth. Don't expect it to come by birth. And it's available to everybody, even someone who's not born as a firstborn. Okay, that's, the, that's one big idea. Keep that big idea in mind. I wanna say one little, one more additional point tied into this overarching idea. And, and then we'll see if we wanna continue on this theme or we wanna to continue to something else. So Jacob crosses his hands. Why does he cross his hands? Why doesn't he say, look, why don't the kids switch places? If you want Ephraim to be blessed, put him on your right side. Why cross your hands? So the simple interpretation is he doesn't want to embarrass the children. Bad enough that you're crossing the hand and you're putting your right hand on the younger child. They're just going to make it much worse if you actually um, tell them, hey, move spots because you want to put the younger one on the right side, the place of the older one. So he wants to be more discreet. He crosses his hands. That's the simple meaning. But there are other commentaries who say, no, it's very, very significant that he does not cross his hands. He does not switch their position. He crosses their hands. So what they say is as follows. They say that if you look at the Bible, um, what, what do hands represent? So it depends what it's in relation to. In relation to the head, the hand is more practical and physical. But in relation to the foot, the hand is more spiritual. Right, the foot walks. That's a that's a that's a, that's a, that's a tangible physical act. A hand is much is it's much more spiritual. Even even the even the physical and the physical anatomy. The hand extends from the heart. The heart is the seat of the emotions. The hand is what you use for art. The hand is what you use for things that are more spiritual in your life. So what these comment what this commentator is saying, he's saying as follows. He says, look, we're go, we're giving Ephraim the leadership, but not for all matters only for spiritual matters, not for physical matters. For physical matters, for matters of who's going to rule the family, the older one remains the older one. And therefore, Menashe, the older one, sits at the foot of the right foot of Jacob, because the foot represents the physical leadership. And who gets the physical leadership? It's the older one. And Jacob never intended to give this physical leadership to the younger one. In fact, when Jacob, stole the <clears throat> when Jacob stole the blessings from his own father, depriving his older brother, he didn't deprive him of the physical blessings. He never meant to steal the physical blessings. He didn't. He stole the spiritual blessings. So the image here, where Menashe, the older one, is on the right foot of Jacob, and Ephraim, the younger one, is the right hand of Jacob, represents that Menashe is the still, remains still the firstborn, still remains the leader in physical matters, but not in spiritual matters. And then the idea is in your life, at the physical life and the spiritual life, what comes first? When you bless your children, when you say, may God make you like Menashe and Ephraim, what comes first, the physical or the spiritual? So the idea is the spiritual has to come first because the physical is only significant if it follows the spiritual, if it serves the spiritual. And this can be elaborated upon, but we'll leave that for right now. Do you know who the, who the, the commentator is for this? That was the Nitziva Volazhin. Volazhin was a very famous yeshiva in the old country and uh, very famous. It survived probably at least, to, I think, almost till, to, I think till, till the communist revolution. And it's not Hasidic, 
but it's a Lithuanian. I know a lot of people who descend from people who were in the yeshiva of Volozhin. The Rosh yeshiva, there were two heads of the yeshiva in Volozhin. Both were very famous. But one of them, his name was the Nitziv. That was his acronym. And the Nitziv was an acronym for Naftali Tzvi Yehuda Berlin. Now, you may, have know who the, you may have heard something about Berlin because if you ever heard of the Bar Ilan University in Israel, the Bar Ilan University is named after the, the, the descendant of the Nitziv who changed his name from, from Berlin to Bar Ilan. That's that. Yeah. Oh, there was a woman at Chabad, at Chabad, who used to work at Chabad, Randy Hill, I don't know, if, uh, I don't know if, if everyone remembers her, but in any case, she is a direct descendant. Her name was Berlin, her maiden name was Berlin, direct descendant from the Nitziv. So I always used to remind her that she is a direct descendant from the Nitziv, which she knew, but um, I always make sure to remind her of that. In any case, that's the Nitziv. The Nitziv was one of the Rosh Yeshivas in Volozhin. He was, uh, he had a, in addition to his teachings of Talmud, and usually Yeshiva, they spent time on Talmud, not so much on the Chumash, but he had a, he had a class on the Chumash, on the Bible in the Yeshiva of Volozhin, and he collected his teachings and he made it into a book, two books on the Parsha. That's the Nitziv. What actually happens to Menashe? Do we know? Menashe becomes a leader. He says Menashe, he says Menashe becomes a leader too. They both will be leaders. Rashi explains the descendants, some of the kings of the 10 tribes of Israel descended from Menashe as well. Now, one more point. Sorry, I'm sorry, Rabbi. Yes. Going back to the first question. Does Jacob ever learn that Jacob, that Joseph names his son Menashe because he wants to forget that he came from the house of uh, Joseph. Okay, I want to I want to address that. I want to address that, but I want to address in, the, in other words, I want to speak about the big picture before I speak about that specific case. Um, why is Jacob taking? We spoke about this. We said Jacob takes two of his grandsons and says, "Grandsons, you're going to be just like my sons." I remember when my grandfather passed away. I don't know why I'm saying this. When my grandfather passed away. Um, he passed away at 93, and he had six sons, six children, and many, many grandchildren. The oldest grandchild was eight years younger than his youngest daughter. Okay, complicated, almost as complicated as, as the Parsha. So I have my grandfather, he had six children. His youngest was, ZC was, is her name? She lives in Vermont. And then eight years later, his oldest grandson was born. Herschel was his is his name. So Herschel is sitting with the grandkids and says, I don't understand. I was, I knew my grandfather almost as long as his daughter knew him, just eight years short. And yet she's the child and I'm the grandchild. It's not fair. Okay, fine. Whatever he was saying. What I'm trying to say here, I just remember him saying this. What I'm trying to say here is all of a sudden, imagine if, okay, you, you're a grandchild. No, you're a son. What is happening here? Why is he doing this? So I told you the technical reason. God said you're going to have two more, more children. He didn't have two more children. Okay, so my grandchildren will be my children. But there's something more spiritual here, something more significant. And this is what a commentary that the Rebbe taught, but I'm going to pull the verse open just to see it inside because when we see it inside, we'll get, we'll get the feel. So he says like this. He says, verse five. And now, as for your two sons who were born to you in the land of Egypt, until I came to you to the land of Egypt, they are mine, Ephraim and Menashe. In this verse, there has to be the reason why Menashe and Ephraim, Ephraim and Menashe are being selected. Why the grandchildren are selected to be the children. What's so great about them? I'm sure he had many grandchildren. I'm sure many of them got good marks on the test. I'm sure many of them were good athletes. Why these two? Why were these two selected? It's right there in the verse, black on white. You cannot miss it once you hear the Rebbe's interpretation. Before you hear the, before, before you hear it, you can miss it. After you hear it, you can't miss it. Says the Rebbe as follows. Your two sons who were born to you in the land of Egypt until, meaning ad, before I came to you to the land of Egypt. What is unique about these two sons? They were the only people raised the first the first Jews raised as Jews away from the family in a foreign land. Joseph was kidnapped at 17. At 17 you're already a spirit you're you're, you're already uh, spiritually on a path. Many years after your bar mitzvah you're already studying Talmud. 
You know, he's 17, you're ready in yeshiva for six years. Okay? So Joseph, okay, Joseph was not born and raised in a foreign territory. Menashe and Ephraim, the first two Jews born and raised in a foreign territory, and yet remain loyal to the teachings. That is a very difficult task. That is very impressive. How many people came to this country? We're in the old country. They were very loyal to, to, to Torah. Maybe they learned in Volazhin. I know two people living in Greenwich that their Gzaydas learned in Volazhin. And yet they come, they cross to a new country. It's very hard to maintain that. It's very difficult. And people who did, it was very difficult. I'm not talking about in the 50s, but I'm talking about people in the, in the turn of the century. It's very difficult to remain loyal to traditional Judaism. And yet Menashe and Ephraim are able to do that. For Jacob, this is unbelievable. This means there's a continuation. This means that this project, this startup called Judaism will survive. Who is the model? Ephraim and Menashe. Why? They were born to you before I came to Egypt. Before we came to Egypt, I made a yeshiva, I made a shtetl, I made a ghetto. Before then, they were born in Egypt alone, and they were able to remain loyal to Judaism. So that is what the Rebbe says about why they were chosen. Now, Neil keeps pulling me back, so I'm going to give it, I'm going to say it. I don't want to say it, but I'm going to say it. Not because it's not important, because I said it in the past, and I wanted to focus on other things, but sometimes you follow God's plan, not your own. Okay. <laughs> so we know that Menashe and Ephraim were the first two people to be able to be born in a, in a, a born and raised in a society foreign to Judaism, and yet remain successfully loyal to Judaism. We know that. Now the question is, how do they do it? What did their father tell them? What was the secret of Joseph to raise foreign, uh, children in a foreign land with nobody else there to be able to be loyal to Judaism? And that, says the Rebbe, is alluded to in the names of Ephraim and Menashe. And there's basically two steps. And I'm going to give you two models. And I'm going to ask you which one is better. But it's a trick question because you really have to do both. So let's say you want to raise Jewish children and you educate them, but you send them to schools that are not Jewish, or they live in a society or they with other children who are not Jewish. What do you want to do? How do you, how do you, um, um, what feeling do you want them to have? Do you want them to stand out or do you want them to fit in and be successful? In other words, do you want them to be different or do you want them to belong? And that's a very deep question. And most people want to belong and they want their children to belong. But the question becomes, do you, pay, do you pay a price for that? And I'll tell you the answer. The answer is that you have to do both. You have to teach your children to be different and you have to teach your children to belong. And some children feel more of the first, some people feel, some feel more of the second, but they have to, they have to, you have to have a little bit of both. And the Rebbe says that's Menashe and Ephraim. What does Menashe mean? God made me forget my father's home. What does that mean? Is it positive or negative? So the simple interpretation is God made me forget the sorrows of my father's home. That's not what, but, but that's not the spiritual meaning. The spiritual meaning is Joseph is saying he's reminding himself every day of his father's home. Think about this. If you name your son, God made me forget my father's home. What really what you're doing is reminding yourself every day of your father's home. Another way to put it, you're reminding yourself and your son that society, the society you're in is causing you to forget your father's home. So if you're not careful, you're going to forget your father's home and therefore be on guard not to forget your father's home. So Menashe is the awareness that I'm in a spiritually foreign territory and I have to work not to forget my father's home. What is Ephraim? Ephraim is the feeling of God made me fruitful and successful in this land. It's not a feeling I belong in the foreign land. I belong to my father's home. I belong to the past. No, it's a frying. God, you made me successful here. Here is the land of, of my success. Here is where I'm fruitful. Here is what I want to be. It's not looking back. It's looking forward. It's looking to the present and forward. Which one do we need? Which one is more valuable? You need both. You have to um, create the awareness within yourself that you are an extension of the past. You're an extension of your father's home. That the, that the values in society are not necessarily consistent with your own values. And yet you have to understand that the reason why you're here is not to be different, but to be successful, to, to, to lay roots, to be successful and ultimately to affect the rest of the land. And each child represented one of those 
feelings, but they each had a little bit of both. They're each being raised in this house. So in other words, in the beginning, the firstborn is Menashe. First, before you can be successful in the land, you have to re retain your own identity. Menashe is the retention of your own identity, cult cultivating your own identity. After you cultivate your own identity, you can go out to the world and be successful. And that's why Menashe is the older one and Ephraim is the younger one. However, from Jacob's perspective, what's the goal? The goal is not to live in the past. The goal is not to say it was so wonderful when we sat in Volusian and we sat in the shtetl and we, and we, and we, and we lived um, in, in, in the way of our, of our tradition. That's not the goal. It's very important to have that nostalgia, but that's not the goal. The goal is where God placed you today, be fruitful, be successful, both physically and spiritually. So the goal is Ephraim. That's why from Jacob's perspective, Ephraim is first. Ephraim, the younger one, meaning the one that comes second is the goal but you still can't skip the, skip the skip step of Ephraim. So Ephraim and Menashe with their names is the roadmap of how to raise children in a spiritually foreign territory uh, without anybody else, without any other family to keep, to, keep you, to keep that environment alive. So in that sense, we just covered a lot. We covered why Jacob splits this family, why Jacob gives this great blessing to Menashe and, to, to Menashe and Ephraim, their unique position, not because they were born to Joseph, who, jo who he loves. No, it wasn't because of their, 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 their birth. It was because of what they achieved. They achieved the ability to remain loyal to God in a foreign, in a foreign land before Jacob comes down to Egypt. How do you do so? Menashe and Ephraim. Be aware of your past, be successful in the present and future. You can't go to step two before you have step one, but the goal is not step one. The goal is step two. So now bring in the that when they come in, Jacob says, uh, who, are, who are they? Jacob, uh, um, Jacob says, who are these people? In other words, there's, you want to, there's, there's different ways to read the verse. Jacob senses, I just gave you the whole spiel, Menashe and Ephraim, Jacob senses that there's not, it's not so simple because later there's going to be, um, Ephraim, Ephraim's history does not end well. The 10 tribes don't end well. In other words, the 10 tribes secede and ultimately Ephraim because, becomes the leader of the 10 tribes and they descend into, into idol worship and they, it doesn't end well. But let me put it to you that mildly. And if you look at the prophets, the prophets uh, pour fire and brimstone on Ephraim as a symbol of the 10 tribes who become very successful in the land, but forget about, in the land of Israel, but forget about God. So when Jacob, so when they come before him, Jacob senses that there's a spiritual problem. He says, who are these? Who are, are they Egyptians? Are they Jews? What's their culture? How were they raised? And Joseph says, they are my children who God gave me. So Joseph reassures Jacob that they are indeed righteous. And the fact that, uh, that in, in the future, there's some negativity that emerges from them just, just shows how powerful they are. I mean, people are spiritually powerful. They have free choice to use that strength to the positive or to the negative. Okay, there's a lot to say about the blessings. Um, if I could make a mental mark next year, we're not doing Menashe and Ephraim, God willing. We're not doing Joseph. We're going straight to the blessings of, of, of Jacob before how he blesses his children. Someone please remind me next year, same time, same place, that we want to start from the fourth reading. In any case, God will give us many long years and we'll have plenty of time to study all, all, all of the Torah and to grow in all areas of life and spiritually, we'll remember our parents' home, we'll remember the past, and we'll be successful in the present and future. So nostalgia is good, but that's not the purpose. That's what we learned from Menashe and Ephraim. Have a wonderful day and a happy new year. May the new year bring only blessings, happiness, goodness, only good things, and we should see each other in good health, maybe even in person. <laughs> year 2021. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you.